Design of Two Blue Vortex is officially out. And when I say it's probably the biggest chapter of Two Blue Vortex, or maybe of Boruto's entire run, I may not be exaggerating. See, almost every single chapter of Two Blue Vortex has left us with an absolute cliffhanger. Though there was no cliffhanger more cliffhangery than Chapter 8's cliffhanger. As Chapter 8 ended with Jura, the main antagonist of this arc, looking down upon Himawari in Konoha, confused, because Jura, so far as he knew, had come to Konoha looking for Naruto, and had found Naruto's chakra signature. And thus, using his sensory abilities, he followed Naruto's chakra signature until he was able to finally come upon the man he wanted to devour. However, much to his confusion and possible dismay, Naruto is not the person he found at the end of the bijou-colored rainbow. No, instead, that was Naruto's daughter. Himawari. And thus, for the past month, every single Boruto fan on Earth has been scrambling, trying to figure out a reason for why and how Himawari could possibly have Bijou Chakra. Was it because at some point during the Fourth Great Shinobi World War, Naruto was the Jinchuriki of all nine tailed beasts together, and now Himawari holds on to a vestige of all of the chakra of all nine tailed beasts, turning her into a pseudo ten tails Jinchuriki? Did somehow Shikaku get moved from the teapot that he was existing in in the Uzumaki household into Himawari? Or is Himawari? just like her old man, a Chincherki of Kurama. Well, unfortunately, because in Chapter 8, Jura only said Bijou, which means tailed beast, and not something like Kyubi or Jubi, which means nine tails or ten tails, we had no real way of knowing just what tailed beast chakra resided inside of Himawara. But now, we do. And sometimes, we just have to listen to Occam's Razor and understand that sometimes, the simplest answer is the correct one. Because Chapter 9 has revealed to us that Himawari is the next Jinchuriki of Kurama. But how did this happen? And is she a full-powered Jinchuriki? Will she be able to manifest something like a Kurama chakra mode, or will she be more similar to Kinkaku and Ginkaku? Well, today we're gonna try and answer all those questions and more, because believe it or not, Himawari being the Jinchuriki of Kurama is not the only thing that happened in Chapter 9 of Two Blue Vortex. The extent of the Shinju's abilities was also explored. Kashin Koji presented himself as a future ally of Konoha and Shikamaru. Boruto absolutely embarrassed Kawaki, and it was revealed that Boruto can't use his karma marking. There is so much to talk about in this chapter that we really have no option but to get started talking about, which is why today we're talking chapter nine of Two Blue Vortex Explained. Before we get to explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you love the idea of me breaking down the newest and hottest chapters of manga that you're reading, go ahead and follow my other channel, The Weeb Commander, where instead of talking about Naruto and Boruto, I talk all other anime and manga. And if you just love the idea of me talking about anime and manga, go ahead and follow my anime podcast, Otaku's Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime and manga this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And if you want to see me live, come on down to Comic Palooza, May 24th to the 26th in Houston, Texas. I'm going to do six whole panels talking about things like Naruto, Hunter Hunter, how to become a YouTuber, and so much more. And it would mean a lot to me if you came on out to see me. But before we get into all that, today we got to talk about our favorite reoccurring sponsor to the page, HelloFresh. See, whether you're trying to eat better, save money, or take less trips to the grocery store, HelloFresh is here to help you. You. HelloFresh wants to give you access to fresh ingredients and chef crafted meals at a price you'll like delivered directly to your door. See, HelloFresh wants to end the food waste epidemic, and thus every HelloFresh box is packed full of farm fresh ingredients, and everything arrives pre portioned to your door for less hassle and less food waste. So, never again will you have to stare blankly into a fridge wondering what you're going to make for dinner because once you give HelloFresh a try and dive into their biggest ever menu, yes, they're offering four. 43 or more meal options a week, you are almost guaranteed to find meals that you like every single week. See, I've used HelloFresh for almost six years. In fact, it was through the usage of HelloFresh that I was able to lose 50 pounds during college. And it's the ease, deliciousness, and nutrition that comes with every HelloFresh meal that helps me maintain this body today. But enough talking about these delicious meals, let's go show you one. Tonight, we're making one pan curry turkey tacos. This is one of the easiest meals to prepare for four people. People. The only chopping that I need to do is this cilantro. Now I just have to brown up the ground turkey with a little bit of curry powder, salt, pepper, and some stock concentrate. Then I combine this pico de gallo, mango, salt, pepper, and olive oil to make a salsa. I then combine this yogurt with one fourth a teaspoon of cumin, salt, and pepper. Wrap my tortillas in wet paper towels and throw them in the microwave on high for 30 seconds. Then it's just a matter of making your beautiful tacos and enjoying them. 
and there is a lot to enjoy. And that's not all you can enjoy with HelloFresh, because they also got you covered for dessert, which is why I'm cracking into this key lime pie. Let's see just how impressive this is. Mmm. That's some of the best key lime pie I've ever had. So what are you waiting for? Go to HelloFresh.com and use code NCHAMMER23SWEET for free dessert for life. Yes, that's right. You'll get one free dessert item per box so long as you're an active subscriber. That's code NCHAMMER23SWEET at HelloFresh.com for free dessert for life. Sounds like a pretty sweet deal to me. So, Chapter 9 spent a lot more time focusing on Team 10 than I thought it would. And yet, for some reason, I'm not upset about it. See, I don't think anybody would judge me if I came out and said I don't enjoy this generation's Team 10 as much as I enjoy Naruto's Team 10. Shikadai is just Shikamaru. Inujin has all of the worst qualities of both Eno and Sai. And Chocho just kind of reminds me of like a female British rapper. Like when it comes down to Inoshikacho formations, we've really spent the least amount of time with this one than any of the other two we've ever been exposed to. Like genuinely, I think we've got more time with Inoshichoza and Shikaku than these three. But amongst the myriad of other things that happened in chapter nine, I genuinely believe this chapter was the new gens team tens coming out party is not only did they grace the cover art of this chapter but also the events of this chapter very much showed us that over the course of the last three years during the time skip this generation of Inishika show has been training with each other relentlessly to the point where they're now able to at a pretty high level battle against a shinju without even communicating with each other a level of fluidity and teamwork you really wouldn't see in any other team outside of an Inishika show and i thought that was genuinely one of the more underrated and fun aspects of this chapter there was a lot of underrated and fun aspects of this chapter, so let's get right on into it. The chapter picks up right where chapter 8 left off, with Jura standing in front of Team 10 and Himawari. And in this moment, Jura is saying, I intended to arrive in front of Naruto, but arriving in front of a little girl was not within my expectations, essentially re-establishing the fact that Himawari for some reason is outputting the same chakra signature as her father. Naruto. An underrated and borderline unnoticed aspect of this page is that this page is only the second ever time we've been able to see the Tomei on Jura's stomach. And we see them not only once, but twice. And they're in a confirmation that all but confirms to us that Jura has nine Tomei on his chest. When you tie that into an ability that we see Jura use a little bit later in this chapter, it all but solidifies that Jura is, in fact, the juvenile ten tails given ego. But we'll get there in a second. Chicken Eye realizing the threat of Jura appearing in front of Himawari and saying that he's confused that it's not Naruto, immediately gets into contact with the sensory unit, telling the sensory unit that two people seem to have invaded Konoha, one of which resembles Sasuke, and that they need urgent backup. The Shikadai then possibly to stall for time until said backup arrives, asks Jura what he's doing in a place as remote as this, at which point Jura pulls out a book and begins to flip through it until eventually he gets to a page that seemingly holds Shikadai's information, at which point he rattles off the fact that, oh, you're Shikadai from the group that Moegi was in charge of and the current Hokage's son. Now, we don't necessarily know why Jura has this book, but it could lead us to a couple of possible conclusions. Either there's a book out there that has the information of every ninja from Konoha, which wouldn't make a lot of sense for ninjas, but considering the fact that in Boruto there is very canonically a ninja card game with people like Moegi, Naruto, Sasuke, Chodro, and basically every other Naruto character you've ever known and loved, I guess the idea that there's a book out there that talks about every single ninja in Konoha like there's some kind of prestigious figure, Shikadai included, and since Jura is trying to accumulate as much knowledge as possible to further expand his knowledge of the universe, I guess it would make sense that this is the kind of book that Jura would hold on to, but the other possible conclusion to come to here is that the Shinju that come from Konoha, like Hidari and Moegi Shinju, have enough of their memories that they're able to give a synopsis on all of the ninja of Konoha to Jura. And if anybody would be able to do this, it would be the Moegi Shinju. However, if that's the case, it brings up a couple of logistical issues. See, because if the Moegi Shinju remembers enough about Moegi's life to rattle off facts about Shikadai, this would mean that the Shinju are way further in their ego development than even we began to anticipate. And that genuinely, all of the Shinju hold on to all of the memories of the person their claw grime bit. And if that's the case, Jura being such a blank page, all but solidifies the fact that he 
did not come from a human. As if he did come from a human, he should have had memories like Moegi, which could be further kindling on the fire that Jura is, once again, the juvenile ten tails given ego. Shigenai then responds to this by saying, so what, do you want me to relay a message to my father? To which Jura responds with, unfortunately, I actually have business with the previous Hokage, Naruto. And thus I followed a chakra signature trail to what I believed was Naruto, but yet here I'm stood in front of Himawari. A situation as perplexing to Jura as it is to Shikadai and Himawari. It's at this point that Inujin decides to open his big fat mouth and say there's no way that the seventh would be here because three years ago, dot dot dot, at which point Shikadai very aptly cuts him off and says, hey, don't say anything that doesn't need to be said. It's nice to know that the blonde in the group is still somehow the dumbest in every single generation. And it's at this point that Jura says, oh, I see. So now I've at least confirmed that he's not inside of the village. And thus the response to the nine tails I was following is coming from this little girl. Now, when I read the bubble that said nine tails, I switched between three fan translations to make sure that every single one said nine tails. I now realize because of the later contents of this chapter, that was incredibly redundant. But in this moment, Jura is confirming to us that he wasn't just following Bijou Chakra, but QB Chakra, the Chakra of Karama, which answers the question of, oh, why didn't Jura go after Shukaku, who's in the Uzumaki household? Well, that's because Jura somehow knew Naruto's Chakra signature and how it related to Karama's, which means that Jura was not just following any tailed beast chakra. And the fact that Jura knew that Naruto A had Karama and B, what Karama's chakra felt like, implies that Jura somehow or another is familiarized with Karama's chakra flow, which could really only come from the fact that the juvenile Ten Tails ego came from Jigen, who would be very familiar with Karama's chakra flow. Now, the news that Himawari is holding on to Karama's chakra stuns all of Team Ten and Himawari. Shigenai says, what are you talking about? What connection does Himawari have to the Nine Tails? To which Jura responds, I, I don't know. I literally just got here, but it doesn't matter to me because I'm taking the child anyways. And it's at this point that a giant tree sprouts out of the ground and begins to enclose around Himawari. And as this tree begins to grow around Himawari, we can see her being sucked into it slowly but surely. However, almost immediately, Shikadai uses his shadow paralysis jutsu and yanks the tree open. And we need to talk about just how impressive this is. Shikadai is using shadow paralysis jutsu to counter wood release and not just any old wood release wood release from Jura. This means that Shikadai, as it currently stands, based off everything we know about current strength Shikamaru, is now stronger than Shikamaru. Because Shikamaru, in his own light novel, tried to destroy a tree with shadow release, and while he was able to make the tree creak, he wasn't even able to snap a tree in half. Making apart the rising of divine wood release to free Himawari with just shadow paralysis jutsu is a crazy feat. And as soon as Himawari is freed from the clutches of this tree, Inujin uses Super Beast Imitation Scroll to draw a chameleon that uses its tongue to rip Himawari out of the tree, after which he throws her to where Chocho catches her. And even Jura is impressed by this, reveling in the fact that they were able to work together seamlessly without saying one word to each other. And that is the true strength of an Inashikacho formation. Their techniques are supposed to work so well together and so flawlessly that communication isn't even really a necessity. And Jura, out of respect for their teamwork and their ferocity, says, okay, I'll put my guard up, but I want you to to know our only goal is Himawari Uzumaki. We have no hostility towards Team 10, and thus if you give us Himawari, we'll leave. And to this point, the Shikadai is finally able to get into contact with his father, who wants a rundown on the situation and to know if Shikadai is okay. And to this point, the Shikadai tells Shikamaru that the enemy only wants Himawari, and they're focused on her because of the Nine Tails Chakra, which befuddles Shikamaru, who's really gone through a lot in the last couple of chapters. And to this point, that we get a solo shot of Jura and Himawari staring each other down, with Himawari wondering, why are they targeting me? After which we cut to Kawaki, who is out cold and being shuck by Delta, asking him to get it together. But the reason that we cut to Kawaki is because Amido is watching over this fight, or I guess more specifically, watching over Kawaki. It's at this point that Amido says something rather interesting. Amido, in stunned disbelief of the fact that Kawaki just got knocked out cold, asks, what are these guys? And in a rare moment of, I believe Amado here, I genuinely think he has no idea what the Shinju are or where they came from. And if you're one of the people who genuinely doesn't understand Amado's motivations and believe that somehow or another he's gonna be tied to Shibai, if Amado is truly all-knowing when it comes to Otsutsuki, him not knowing what the Shinju are mean that they are an anomaly never before seen. And that 
is kind of scary. We then cut away from Amado back to the main character of our story, Boruto, who's staring at his karma marking. The camera then pans out as we see Kashin Koji, who says, Boruto, they're starting to move. Boruto then responds, where are they heading? Are they heading towards Konoha? To which Kashin Koji says, yes, take off towards the triangle. Now, this is kind of a weird direction if you don't really understand what's going on at this moment, but basically what Kashin Koji is saying here is that he's placed a ton of toads around Konoha, and every single one of these toads bears a flying Raijin mark. On top of this, somewhat inconveniently, every single one of these toads seems to be carrying a large shape, using one out of their forelimbs to hold on to a cutout of a shape so Boruto can know which one to jump to. And thus, Boruto picks up his sword and begins to make his way towards the triangle and surely that's all we could take away from this scene right wrong that's by far and away the smallest thing we can take from this scene because you know where kashin koji and boruto are before boruto takes off for the triangle orochimaru's lab oh nick what do you mean there's no way to guarantee that they're at orochimaru's lab that could just be their hideout listen you're right it's not necessarily guaranteed to be orochimaru's lab because it could also be Ryuchi Cave. But Nick, have you come to this absolutely ludicrous conclusion? Oh, just the fact that the walls and the floors have scales, and for some reason, all of the lights are snakes holding the balls of lights in their mouth, which is exactly how Orochimaru's caves are lit. So why is Boruto inside of either Ryuchi Cave or Orochimaru's caves? Well, that's gonna be its own video. You know how this works, but I can guarantee you he's in one of those two things. That video will be out Sunday. Make sure you follow and hit the noti bell. We then cut back to Team 10 and Shikadai who's saying, all right, just to confirm, you thought you were coming to Naruto and you ended up at Himawari. Do you realize that you made a mistake and yet you are still focusing on Himawari? To which Jura rather politely is like, yeah, okay, I'll field this question and give you more exposition so, so he's like all right sit down basically i was following a trail that should have brought me to the nine tails because i know the nine tails is in naruto and yet at the end of that trail was himawari and this kind of sends shikadai into a spiral shikadai begins to think but karamu's already eradicated from existence three years ago this also sends himawari into a bit of a spiral as she begins to wonder how the chakra of the nine tails could have possibly gotten inside him. but nobody's more confused than jura who's like yeah we're surprised by this development as well and so we have questions but eating that child might answer some of my questions not usually the way i go about figuring out the answers to questions but hey different cultures different ways to answer questions and apparently i'm not the only one who doesn't go about answering questions that way because inashika chose like did you just say you were going to eat a child? At which point, Jura says, I warned you, ladies and gentlemen of Inashika Cho. You could have given up Himawari, but instead you chose violence. So this is what violence looks like. And it's at this point that we see Jura's back. And we see, once again, the symbol on the back of his cloak, which is like a really shoddily drawn Rinnegan with nine circles around it, which once again is very clearly supposed to invoke the image of the Rinne Sharingan. Dying Jura to the ten tails now shikamaru really doing his best at just not mobilizing towards a threat as the person who's supposed to be the strongest ninja in the village tells the reinforcements heading to team 10's location their location but at this point that a toad pops up in the hokage's office and this toad is presumably conveying a message from kashin koji who's asking to be connected to ino now while it's easy for us to be like oh shikamaru saw a toad he must know that's kashin koji and therefore shikamaru is now aligned with kashin koji since he's going through with what kashin koji asked shikamaru has never met Kashin Koji. The only person from Konoha who's met Kashin Koji is Kakashi. So he probably doesn't know immediately who the toad is. We then cut to Kawaki, who's waking up from his whittle nap, which Delta is stoked about because if Kawaki died on her watch, she never would have been able to face Ada again. Kawaki then continues his role of just being the worst dude around and yells at Delta for trying to burst his eardrums with her concern and lets her know that he's almost done recovering from the damage that Jura did to it. To which Ada rather interestingly responds and says, oh yeah, you're basically immortal. I guess your recovery just kicks in automatically, which I guess is fair because he's a full Otsutsuki. So yes, he is immortal, but it's never necessarily been established that the Otsutsuki inherently have a healing factor. Like, yeah, they have high durability and sure, we saw Madara bounce back from getting a hole kicked in his chest, but that was mostly attributed to the fact that he had Hashirama's cells. No other Otsutsuki has ever really shown that they have a regeneration ability, but Kawaki being able to regenerate the damage done to him by Jura because he is a full Otsutsuki all but 
confirms that they have one, which is a relatively minor detail, but interesting. Delta then rather aptly says, okay, now that you're done recovering, let's get back in the fight. They're trying to steal Himawari, who she believes is Kawaki's little sister. But instead of going to battle against the Shinju, who are trying to steal Himawari, and who are very much Otsutsuki threats, Kawaki realizes in this moment that Boruto just flying Raijin into Konoha. And for some reason, that's more important than the Shinju. After which we get a panel of Boruto honestly just showing off how much drip he has he's holding onto his sword his cape's blowing in the wind and it wasn't until this panel that i realized that boruto's wearing a ton of pins on his lapel and his pins are really interesting because he's wearing four of them and they're a leaf a bolt a sun and presumably an omamori now omamori for those of you who don't know are japanese amulets sold at shinto and buddhist shrines all throughout japan and these omamori are usually said to convey different kinds of either luck or protection rather interestingly these four symbols all also tie into the four most important people in Boruto's life. And if you were to take into account Boruto's Uzumaki necklace, you could say that on Boruto's body, he wears the symbols of the five most important people to him. And I believe genuinely, now that I've seen them and the symbols are so obviously tied to people like Sarada, Himawari, Mitsuki, Kawaki, and Naruto, that these symbols, be they pins or a necklace, will one day serve as a functional connection between Boruto and the people that these pins are supposed to represent. And understand that connection and how it will play out in the future could be massive for anticipating what the ending of Boruto will look like. And that video will be coming out on Tuesday. Follow Naughty Bell. Now, after we bask in the glory of Boruto's drip, we see that he's looking at the world's worst Christmas tree that Jura and Hidari created with the five guards that tried to stop them. Thus, he realizes that this wood release means that the Shinju had been there. Shikamaru then immediately reconnects with Boruto and tells him that once again, this is an unofficial connection through Ino. Then informs Boruto that two enemy that resemble the Shinju he was talking about have invaded Konoha, and they're after his little sister, Himawari. He then explains the fact that they're after her for her Nine Tails Chakra, and asks Boruto if he knows anything about that, to which Boruto doesn't seem to have an answer to. See, there's an incredibly prevalent theory going around the Boruto community right now that Boruto has the ability to see into the future, and yet Boruto seems befuddled by the idea that Himawari could have any Nine Tails Chakra. And the same seems to be true for Kashin Koji, which could be a rather interesting wrinkle in the idea that Boruto can see into the future. It could establish the fact that if Boruto can see into the future, he either A, doesn't have control of it, or B, can't see everything. But before Boruto can even get a chance to sink his teeth into the idea that his little sister has Karama inside of her, Kawaki and Delta show up to Boruto's location. And just like we got with Boruto, we got a full panel of Kawaki just showing off his drip and confirming for the sensory unit that he's confirmed Boruto's location to be near the site of the murder of the Joni. It's at this point that Boruto asks Kawaki why he's creeping around and asks if he's here with his friends, the two Shinju. It's at this point for a second time in nine chapters, Boruto goes, hold up Shikamaru, I need a second. Somebody who's incredibly powerful found me. Boruto then turns around to Kawaki and asks the incredibly important question, do you have time to be doing this right now? Konoha is under attack. To which Kawaki rather aggravatingly answers, the only threat to Konoha going on right now is you. Which like, he knows isn't true. Hey, Kawaki, you're the one who put him in this situation. Borto then says, enough with the chit chat. Konoha's under attack. How about we go together and go deal with the Shinju? At which point, Kawaki somehow gets the idea that Borto is trying to talk down to him and fires chakra rods at him, which Borto effortlessly dodges like not a singular expression on his face like he's dodging a turtle and this surprises both kawaki and delta but kawaki possibly assuming that this was a fluke once again fires a barrage of chakra rods at boruto which he once again effortlessly dodges however kawaki possibly prepared for boruto dodging his second round of chakra rods tries to capitalize on boruto needing to dodge by closing the distance with one of his shinobi wear claw attacks to which boruto still with no expression on his face, goes weave and then socks Kawaki in the stomach, leading to the fourth time in nine chapters Kawaki has been embarrassed in combat. Now, it's important to note here that the list of people who have ever dodged the chakra rods fired from Ishiki's Dojutsu is incredibly small. Neither KCM2 plus Sage Mode Naruto or full adult six to eight Rinnegan Sasuke could do it. The only people who have ever pulled off that feat were Baryon Mode Naruto and the Shinju, specifically Jura and Tidari, literally last chapter. And while you could absolutely make the argument that chakra rods fired by Kawaki are weaker than 
than Chakra Rods fired by Ishiki and therefore probably slower. Genuinely, there's really nothing to show us that that's the situation. And for all intents and purposes, because of how karma markings work, that shouldn't be the situation. Kawaki, who's 100% Otsutsuki and has unlocked 100% of the karma marking, should have all of the battle experience and abilities of Ishiki. So the feat of dodging the Chakra Rods fired by Kawaki should feasibly scale Boruto's speed to around Baryon Mode Naruto at least. But you know who's not there? Kawaki, who's absolutely folded by the one punch that Boruto lands in his stomach. And Boruto was kind of disgusted by this, calling Kawaki pathetic and asking him how little he trained in the last three years. And Ada is befuddled by what she just saw go down and asks, on the contrary, how much did you train in the last three years? Now, it's at this point that Kawaki, presumably fed up with getting his butt kicked every two chapters, decides to activate his karma marking. However, upon the activation of his karma marking, Boruto's begins to resonate. And that's a bad thing for Boruto. And the toad that Boruto keeps on him that allows for him to communicate with Kashin Koji from across dimensions tells Boruto that he needs to create distance between himself and Kawaki, otherwise he'll go out of control. Thus, Boruto flees from the scene, flying away at high speeds. And it's at this point that Kawaki realizes that Boruto can't control his karma, which is perplexing to both Kawaki and to us as readers. Because while many of us believe that Boruto hadn't been put in a fight that he believed was serious enough yet in Two Blue Vortex to use his karma, and therefore that's why we have haven't seen it, what this is revealing to us is that the reason that Boruto didn't use his karma marking in the battle against Code, the Shinju, or Mitsuki isn't because he didn't need it, but because he couldn't. But we do know from episode 1 or chapter 1 of this story that Boruto does re-establish control of his karma marking, because in response to Kawaki activating his, Boruto activates his. And I seriously doubt that Boruto would activate his karma in a battle against Kawaki if he knew that Momoshiki would take over his body. So why can't Boruto use his karma marking? And how does he re-establish control of his karma marking? Well, it could possibly have something to do with the loss of Boruto's eye, or the fact that Boruto was going against what Momoshiki Shiki thought was his predestined fate. But Nick, in chapter one of the manga, Boruto opens his eye, and we can see it's the Jogon. He hasn't lost his eye. Well, maybe Boruto has to go through some kind of trial that allows him to get that eye back in order to use his karma marking in the future. We can't say for certain, but what I can say for certain is that's going to be the subject of next Thursday's video. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. Follow and hit the noti bell. We have so much to talk about from this chapter. We then cut back to Team 10 and their battle against Jura, and we see Himawari and Inujin running away on one of Inujin's super beast scroll hawks and jura is watching them as they fly away but chikadai decides to capitalize on jura not looking towards him by grasping him with his shadow paralysis jutsu and while chikadai is able to technically bind the movements of jura jura apparently doesn't need to move to unleash incredibly powerful jutsu because in response to being bound by the shadow paralysis jutsu jura begins to seemingly create a tailed beast bomb with his Rinnegan that he's presumably gonna fire off at Shikadai. But Nick, how can we say for certain that this is a tailed beast ball? Well, one, it's circular, two, it grows in size as it's created, and three, it appears to be made out of both negative and positive chakra. And while tailed beast balls in the anime are blue and red, the actual lore behind how to create a tailed beast ball in the manga is by combining an eight to two ratio of positive black chakra and negative white chakra and within the confines of this ball that jura is making with his eye and not his mouth rather interestingly there are two white circles which to me is supposed to convey the fact of the eight to two black to white chakra ratio however before shikadai can get absolutely eviscerated by a personal sized tailed beast ball chocho flies in and grabs jura and redirects the tailed beast ball away from shikadai the tailed beast ball then flies presumably outside of konoha and explodes massively which knocks over chocho and shikadai however himawari and Inu Jin are still safe on their hawk, flying away from the explosion. It's at this point that it's revealed that Sarada and Sumire are making their way towards the explosion, to possibly help in the battle against the Shinju. We then see Shikadai yelling at Inujin that him and Chocho need a lift out of there. So Inujin flies in with his hawk and scoops them up. It's at this point that Hidari asks Jura if it's okay to let them escape, at which point Jura says that my target was just Himawari. If they handed her over, I wouldn't have had to fight them, to which Hidari responds with how foolish, they don't seem to possess much intelligence. And Jura responds with, it's not that they don't possess intelligence. It's that something has made them angry enough that they've overridden their fight or flight response. And whatever it is that made them angry is crucial information to us. That is to say, by understanding what made Team 10 try to protect Himawari when they were fighting against a foe that was much more powerful than them, is crucial information to the Shinju who are desperately trying to become more human. We then cut to Team 10 who are flying away from Jura and Tidari. And Shikadai is telling Team 10 and Himawari that they should be safe from 
any other large explosion so long as they're all near Himawari, as Jiro wouldn't want to try and fire a tailed beast ball at the person that he wants to devour. They then make a plan to lead the Shinju outside of Konoha, because any more massive explosions through the form of tailed beast balls could be devastating to the infrastructure and the people. But when they're formulating this plan to lead the Shinju outside of Konoha, Himawari tells them to drop her off in a random place, and she'll run away on her own, saying even with everybody here, we still stand no chance in a battle against them, and thus she doesn't want to endanger Team 10 with her presence. However, it's at this point that we get a panel of Himawari seemingly standing alone in the middle of a lake, and she seems vastly confused by this. And Himawari continues to look around this lake in confusion until eventually we get a panel that explains exactly what's going on here, because from behind Himawari appears Kurama, who says, well, well, to think that the Ten Tails would be the one to sniff me out. Himawari shocked, then turns around and looks at Kurama, who asks her, Little girl, do you know who I am? To which Himawari replies with, you're the Nine Tails, right? And it's with that panel that this chapter comes to an end. But there's a couple of important takeaways to take away from this interaction between Himawari and Kurama. The first important takeaway is to ask the question, why didn't Kurama present himself to Himawari earlier? Why is it just now that Kurama's chakra has been sensed? Inside of Himawari, is Kurama now presenting himself to Himawari? Was Kurama hiding, re-establishing his strength, or was he just trying to live a peaceful life inside of Himawari? The second important takeaway to take away from this interaction is the fact that Kurama has never been detected inside of Himawari until this point, even though there's incredible sensors around her pretty much at all times. So one could make the argument that people weren't looking for Kurama's chakra signature, and maybe Himawari's chakra signature was so entwined with Kurama's that people just believed that was Himawari's chakra signature, but still, Jiro was able to identify Kurama's chakra signature inside of Himawari. So why couldn't Sasuke do that? Why couldn't Naruto do that? Why can't the sensory unit do that? Is it truly because Kurama and Himawari Himawari's chakra signatures have become one, as she was born from a Kurama Jinchuriki, and therefore she holds on to Kurama's chakra within her own DNA? Or is it because Himawari didn't become a Jinchuriki of Kurama until Naruto and Sasuke were gone? And thus, the two greatest sensors in the entire village, the two people most familiarized with Kurama's chakra, weren't around to see as to whether or not Himawari had Kurama's chakra? Or does Himawari hold on to such a small fraction of Kurama's chakra that it's almost unnoticeable to anybody who's not a Ten Tails reincarnation? as genuinely the most important thing to take away from this interaction is the fact that Kurama is tiny. See, for the entirety of Naruto, there's really existed two different iterations of Kurama. Baby slash Chibi Kurama, who we were introduced to when we were shown Hagoromo creating the Nine-Tailed Beasts, and big, bad, terrifying, full-grown Kurama. This iteration of Kurama inside of Himawari is much closer to Baby Kurama than full-grown Kurama. Substantially less cute than OG Baby Kurama. But what could this mean? Why is Baby Kurama inside of Himawari? Well, it most likely has to do with the fact that Kurama expended a large amount of his chakra in the Baryon mode collision with Naruto, and thus all that's left of Kurama is this small baby vestige of him inside of Himawari. But since Kurama did start off as this baby size, and then eventually grew to the size that he was in Naruto, does this mean that Kurama was possibly hiding inside of Himawari, recollecting his power and chakra, so that one day he could return to his original power? And thus the reason he didn't present himself to Himawari is because he didn't want anybody knowing he was around until he had returned to full power. We can't really say for certain on any of these questions. But I believe it's probably safe to assume that Kurama has returned to this form because of the Baryon Mode collision with Naruto, weakening him to the point of when he was first created. But that doesn't answer the logistical question of how did he end up in Himawari? Because one of the more subtle yet incredibly important takeaways from this interaction is the fact that Kurama isn't sealed. See, the lake analogy inside of Himawari where Kurama is, is not new. Anytime we ever traveled inside of Naruto to spend some time with Kurama, it was always on a lake of sorts. However, it wasn't until the fourth grade Shinobi World's War and the willingness of Naruto and Kurama to come together and work together that Naruto and Kurama were able to co-occupy this lake space without a gate. And because Kurama is seemingly not sealed in Himawari in any capacity whatsoever, this all but guarantees, at least to me, that Himawari and Kurama's chakra were intertwined from the moment of her birth. And thus, because Himawari and Kurama's chakra has thus been forever entwined, when Kurama's chakra dissipated from this world, much akin to a Jinchuriki dying, Himawari's body acted as a 
a magnet for all of the remaining Kurama chakra on Earth, which was enough to give spark to Kurama living once again inside of Himawari. And for the last possibly three years, Kurama has been trying to collect as much of his chakra that's out there in the world as possible to try and regain his original power, which confirms two of my most popular and outspoken theories that I've been talking about for years, that one, Kurama is not gone, and that two, Himawari is a Jinchuriki, most likely of Kurama. It was all in the whiskers. But this does raise a couple of logistical questions like, okay, well then why did the chakra regather at Himawari and not Boruto? And does this mean that Himawari is now gonna unlock Naruto-esque powers and become the co-protagonist of Two Blue Vortex? Maybe. I mean, it is called Two Blue Vortex, and both Boruto and Himawari have blue eyes and come from the Uzumaki clan, so the idea of a co-protagonist situation does not seem so far away. But I'm going to be doing a more detailed dive on what this could mean for Himawari's powers, the future of the protagonist situation in Boruto, and so much more in a subsequent video. In fact, that'll probably be Sunday's video, which means you're going to have to follow the page and hit the noti bell. We got like two weeks of Chapter 9 content to talk about, but I'm curious, what was your guys' favorite? moment from chapter 9 of Two Blue Vortex. Tell me in the comments below and why you guys are down there, please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. God, there's nothing better than being right.